Well, hey everyone, my name is Nathan Jones, and look, I am growing my beer back because it's getting cold. Uh, but anyway, uh, if you're new here, welcome. I like to talk about all things movies, specifically Blu-rays, and today we are talking about Blu-rays. We're talking about Hammer right here. We're talking about Hammer Volume 1, Fear Warning, from Indicator. Now, this is an out-of-print set, unfortunately, but each of these films that I'm going to be talking about today are still available in different uh, ways you can pick them up. And if you're in the UK, which is where this is from, you can still get them individually from Indicator's website. But if you are in the US, I believe all these films are in the Ultimate Collection from Mill Creek of Hammer. And so definitely try to find those as best as you can uh, wherever the markets you are in, because they're still available. But I was able to get this set. Thank you once again to Rob from the Movie Vault. Um, thank, a big shout out for, for you. I know I keep shouting you out every time I talk about this set, but I was actually able to watch each of these films. And so I wanna share with you today the special features and a lot of the things that I appreciated about this set and kind of my journey with all four of the films. And so that's kind of a preview for 2021 is I wanna start looking at all the box sets that I have and really start watching every single one. And a lot of the box sets I've seen in the past, maybe like the Bergman set or um, over here Godzilla, I've seen a few films in there, but I haven't unboxed and I haven't looked into them fully. And so that's one of my missions in 2021. So let's actually just start off uh, at the end of the year for 2020. Let's talk about just maybe a smaller set, this Hammer Volume 1 set. And we're gonna talk about each of these films. So we're gonna be talking about Maniac, The Gorgon, Curse of the Mummy's Tomb, and we're gonna be talking about Fanatic, which also has a, an alternate title when we, when we get to it. So let's actually talk about Maniac from 1963 starting off on our Hammer Volume 1 set. All right, the first film we're going to talk about is from 1963 right here, Maniac, directed by Michael Carreras, who actually has a tie to Hammer and the foundation of, I mean, it's pretty much, is, I think his father, I believe his name was Enrique Carreras, who was tied a lot to Hammer Productions and Hammer Films and where it would go in the 50s, right? Now, I was going to say, this film was great. It is starring Kerwin Matthews, who I know from the Sinbad films, who I really, really love, and who's my favorite Sinbad, for sure. But it also has Nadia Gray in it, and it has uh, George Pastel, who I really like in this film, Lillian Brucey, I hope I'm saying her name correctly, who is actually, in my opinion, the best part of this film. Uh, and you'll see that in the climax of the film as well. And Donald Houston and Justine Lord. And wow, uh, I love this cover, but it kind of gives away some of the elements of the film itself and who the killer is, who uses a blowtorch. Um, by the way, he stalks his, his wife, his daughter, and their lover. The maniac stalks both, all three of them. Um, but anyway, uh, this is a really great film, and it is set in France, and I really love the setting of this film. My God, that's the thing that blew me away first off the bat. Although, I will say, the first thing that you see in this film is rather, rather really shocking and is something that is a little much. It's, it's a rape that happens, but you don't see everything, but it... Eventually, uh, it'll be you know relevant to the plot itself in the film itself and where it will lead um, into this in this film and where you'll see the characters kind of where a lot of their uh, kind of interactions and things that they are going to go ahead and, and move as a plot forward, right? But it's still a little unsettling, especially for 1963, which is a little bit before uh, you would start getting into production codes that would be a little bit more uh, dangerous, like you would get in the 60, late 60s and in the 70s, right? But yeah, this film was great. Um, I, I enjoyed this quite a bit, and there, there's a lot of um, maybe piggybacking on a lot of the Georges Clouseau, Henry Georges Clouseau films, like Les Diabolique, and a lot of the Hitchcock films going on around the time period. But Maniac, Hammer definitely tried to, you know, get into that a little bit with this film in particular. And now, like I said, this is a film that is a little mild, but also a little bit strong. Strong at the very, very beginning, but mild throughout the film, because, you know, the, the killer, the maniac, uses a blowtorch as that is like one of his, you know, uh, signature moves for this film itself. But yeah, no, uh, I, I really enjoyed this film, and uh, I don't want to give too much away, but the climax of the film is just really wonderful, especially Lillian. Uh, I think her character is the best, but I want to tell you a little bit more about the special features and what I thought about it, because I watched all of them, and I even read the booklet that it comes with, and I really enjoyed that element of it right here, that booklet that gives you all the film essays um, with different cast and crew and people who worked um, like with... Uh, Michael Carreras and uh, the, the you know people who like Kim Newman who uh, wrote on Maniac itself and gave you plot spoilers, and so yeah, if we're going through this, there is a a a, a <laughs> can't talk an essay by Kim Newman in 2017, and then there is also Hammer Films and Maniac talking about Michael Carreras. I think he had an interview here um, and talking about his father. And uh, it's on James Carreras, who I think is his son. 
Uh, Jamie Sangster, who was the producer and also the writer for this film right here, he talks about Maniac. And there's also a few other things. I believe there was a, an original poster right here the back and then it gives you all the credits on the presentation of it and the uh, restoration. So let's actually look at the special features. The limited edition uh, has the remaster on a, uh, original mono, mono audio, White Hot Terror Inside Maniac, an 11 minute short from 2017, an analysis of the film by an expert Jonathan Rigby and cultural historian John J. Johnston. Hammer's Women, Nadia Gray, which, I, by the way, um, these sets talk a lot about Hammer's Women, and they have this featurette on it, which I think is really just fantastic. Um, and I, I really love them covering different uh, women, in particular, in these Hammer films uh, that would either go on to do more Hammer films or move on for, from there and really kind of give you a retrospect on that actress, which I think is just really fantastic. But Lindsay Ann Hallman, Gives that a uh, fascinating look on uh, Nadia Gray's look. Uh, fo uh, focus, Polar, tr uh, Trevor Wren, and Clapper, Loader, Ray, Andrew on Maniac. So the two, maybe two people on the production side of it actually gave a conversation about their, their time in France, you know, working on this production, which was really great. Original promotion material, extensive galleries of stills, lobby cards, and posters photography and this 32 page booklet right here. But yeah, I really enjoyed this uh, this film and I thought um, this is a really good introduction of that transition that Hammer would be going from like that late 50s where they were kind of setting their foot um, down and like trying to figure out where they were gonna be going and to their, um, you know, the golden years of, of Hammer, which is exactly what this next film that we're gonna be talking about is one of the gold standards of Hammer and that's the Gorgon. But yeah, Maniac, definitely check it out. Have any of you seen it? Um, I'm definitely curious to know what you thought of it, and um, yeah, let me know in the comment section down below. Let's actually move on from here to the Gorgon. All right, the Gorgon right here. I love this cover. It's pink and whatnot. Um, and then the alternate cover right here kind of just shows you um, the head of Megara, who is not Medusa. Megara is a fury, a Greek fury, not actually one of the sisters of Medusa in actual Greek mythology. But this film is fantastic, and it's directed by Terrence Fisher. This is from 1964. It's the last time you would see Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee, and Terrence Fisher all together at once. But man, oh man, this film is fantastic. In fact, I actually talked recently about this film with my buddy Daniel on Cobwebs. And if you want to check out the description down below, I have an hour-long conversation with him about this film. And there's so many great things about this film. Besides the fact that we have Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee, you also have um, Richard Pascal, who is our, our main protagonist in this film, Paul. But, oh my God, Barbara Shelley, the best part of this film. Oh my God, she carries this entire movie throughout it. Um, but Prudence Hyman actually plays the Gorgon, uh, which I don't want to get too much into spoilers if you haven't seen this film. And I, I think she does a really fantastic job too, but there's some there's some crossover with why I just brought that up. Um, but also we have Michael Goodlife in this film as well, but man oh man, the, the Gorgon is one of the best films uh, in Hammer. And I haven't watched every Hammer out there. In fact, I'm still pr relatively new to Hammer, but I'm really enjoying my ride. And I think the Gorgon is one of the best films that I've seen so far. It's the setting is really great. Casco Borski is really, really great. I know it was a Frankenstein production kind of combination of the two, but I really enjoyed this story because it was it's Hammer's own original kind of story. And it was a female monster. And this is not like the mummy. This is not a werewolf. This is not Dracula, Frankenstein. Some Frankenstein's monster. This is, you know, those are original things that Universal kind of used, uh, you know, in the past. But with the Gorgon, it's Hammer's own thing, and there's it's one and done. It's 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 original thing, and I really love that Barbara Shelley um, wanted to utilize snakes, uh, real snakes, if she, you know, um, were to utilize within the Gorgon itself. But yeah, this is such a unique monster film. And I, I, I really love it. And if you want to hear my in-depth discussion of the Gorgon, check out that podcast down below, Cobwebs. It's really fantastic. And also give Daniel some, some credit because he talks all about Hammer and all about uh, different gothic cinema. And I, yeah, I highly recommend it. He's, he's a great guy. But anyway, yeah, have you seen the Gorgon? Let me know down in the comment section down below if you've seen it and I want to hear your thoughts on it. Before we jump into the uh, Curse of the Mummy's Tomb, let me talk to you a little bit about the Gorgon special features that it has with the disc. Original mono audio uh, high definition remaster. 
audio commentary with Daughters of Darkness, Sam Deegan and Kat Ellinger. Heart of Stone, uh, Inside the Gorgon, a 14-minute analysis of the film by uh, Jonathan Rigby and cultural historian John J. Johnston. Hammer's Women on Barbara Shelley, which is one of the best things here. Uh, Patricia McCormick examines the life and career of the first leading lady of British horror. Appreciation of Matthew Holness, the actor, writer, director of Hammer Fan, explores the aspects of the film, has the original trailer, promotional material with the stuff inside, um, comic strip adaptation uh, on there from 1977 from House of, Horror, uh, House of Hammer magazine. And then um, it has uh, this 36 page book in here that kind of just covers all of the, you know, the film essays and the people who were involved in the production itself, like Terrence Fisher and uh, Christopher Lee. And I thought it was really interesting. So let's look real quick. Oh, by the way, John Gilling uh, wrote this film, which I thought was really cool and really had a, had a uphill battle apparently with writing the script of it and adapting it. But Marcus Hearn uh, talks a lot about the Gorgon. That's the first film essay here. And then we also have um, the Gorgon, uh, for, the Hammer's first female monster, which talks a lot about Barbara Shelley and also um, talks a little bit about Prudence Hyman as well. And then we have uh, Barbara Shelley on the Gorgon, her time with um, talking about the Gorgon going back all the way up to 2010 when she did this interview. And then uh, promotion of the Gorgon, which I thought was really interesting. This film and also Curse of the Mummy's Tomb, Curse of the Mummy's Tomb were promoted, promoted together. And I thought that was really interesting. And the promotions uh, here are really interesting and kind of fascinating at the time for 1964. So actually, speaking of this transition, let's actually move on to Curse of the Mummy's Tomb. Like I said, this film right here was actually promoted alongside the Gorgon. It came out at the same time, 1964 as a double bill. And this one right here was the bigger household name because it's a mummy, right? And the mummy has already been established by Universal, Abbott and Costello at the time, things like that uh, have already been established. The Gorgon, relatively unknown, although the cast in the Gorgon is a lot bigger than the cast here. The cast here is Terrence Morgan, Fred Clark, Ronald Howard, and introducing Gene Rowland. Who, Gene Rowland, she wasn't around terribly too long in Hammer's lineup or on in, in, in movies in general. She actually kind of exited in the early 70s. But I want to say that this film, uh, directed by Michael Carreras, um, once again, we're talking about Maniac. This is a year later, 1964, when he directed this film. It's relatively safe, and this is one of the lesser known mummy films in Hammer's lineup. So The Mummy from 1959 was the original one with Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee. And uh, right here, uh, this is like the sequel, right? They're not re necessarily related, but we have Fred Clark's character, who is this American, like maybe like a... P.T. Barnum of sorts and finds the mummy and wants to promote it and promote this curse that's uh, been told. And that's kind of the setup of the film. And uh, But it was a really good time. I really enjoyed this film. And uh, I really enjoyed um, the marketing aspect of this film as well. So like I was saying earlier with the Gorgon, I, I there's some promotion techniques that were really interesting. So if we're opening this up right here, um, before we show you um, that promotion technique, I want to show you the alternate cover which I think is interesting. It's a little bit more on the universal horror side of things, to be honest. I actually prefer this outside cover a little bit more. But if we're looking at the promotional material with this booklet itself, it has the film essays. We're going to get into the promotion side of it in a second. But Kat Ellinger writes a little bit on the um, Egyptian Gothic, which is like Egyptomania that happened in the 1800s and 1900s. And it's a really fascinating essay. And I really enjoyed that. Then it talks about the cast of The Curse of the uh, Mummy's Tomb because this is a relatively unknown cast that would go on to do bigger things. Uh, and some American cast too to kind of, you know, cross overseas and see what that promotion looks like. And then the other thing I said, like I said, promoting The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb. One of the things I really enjoyed this is like if you worked at a movie theater, if you want to set up a, a mummy display in a coffin-like box in your outer lobby with a card warning members of the audience, beware the curse of the mummy's tomb will fall upon anyone who touches this mummy. And then if you step and push that button or touch the mummy, a green spot would illuminate right there, kind of showing that curse. So I thought that was really interesting. It kind of reminds me of William Castle in a way. Um, but yeah, uh, and then it has a contemporary re review of the curse of the mummy's tomb, which is actually rather hilarious because it doesn't actually even mention the film itself, really. <laughs> um, but yeah, this was a great film. Um, I enjoyed it quite a bit. It's probably my least favorite of the bunch. Uh, that we are talking about right now, but it's definitely worth talking about. And Curse of the Mummy's Tune, has anyone seen it? I want to know in the comment section down below if you've seen this one. Now we're actually moving on to the final film from 1965. We're talking about a film that has two names, an American one and a, a, a one from the UK. The UK one is Fanatic from 1965, and Die, Die, My Darling is the other one. 
And first of all, I want to say before I jump into this film, holy shit, Tallulah Bankhead. I had no idea about her. And I honestly am relatively new to her films. But around this time, this was like around um, whatever happened to Baby Jane. And a lot of these film stars, uh, female film stars, are kind of taking a comeback uh, around this time in, in the you know early 60s to mid 60s. And it was unfortunately called like hag, a hag film. And that's something that some of the special features cover on this um, particular production here, which I thought was really, really interesting. Um, and also, unfortunately, named. But speaking of special features, um, this is a really great film. Um, before I get into that, let me just tell you the special features. High definition remaster, Ono, Motto, Audio, Die Die My Darling, alternate presentation with the U.S. title sequence. House of Horror Inside Fanatic has 14 members, uh, 14 minutes and analysis of film by Hammer expert Jonathan Rigby and John J. Johnson. Once again, Hammer's Women on Tulula Bankhead, and this is where I found out more about Tulula Bankhead and how illustrious her, her career was and how she just did not give a damn, how she was bisexual, so many things about her. I just, I love her attitude, and I just absolutely, um, I, I find it, she's just ahead of her time. And, uh, yeah, she didn't take anyone's shit, and I thought that was really great. Um, anyway, David Huckvale on composer William Josephs. By the way, the, comp the composition in this film, the score, rather hilarious. Uh, it's very wonky. I don't exactly know the tone of the film. It's definitely one of those ones that I think I might have to watch it a couple more times, but I, I think overall I enjoyed it. Um, but, yeah, the, the score of this film is really interesting. And it's a former dis dentist, too, of all things. Um, and Fanatical Detail, continu uh, Continuity Supervisor Renee Glynn and Second Assistant Director Stuart Black recall the making of Fanatic. Matthew Lombardo on Tallulah Bankhead and Fanatic. The acclaimed playwright discusses his play Looped, which came out a little bit later. And it was actually played uh, Stephanie Powers, who is our, pretty much our main character in this film. Stephanie Powers later on in her life, who would be in this, um, this play Looped, she actually played Tallulah Bankhead's character. Um, if, if you've seen this, you know what I'm talking about. Um, original theatrical trailer, uh, image gallery, extensive collection of promotional material and, uh, all that stuff. And so here it is right here. And then it has this amazing, um, booklet, like, like all indicator things have fanatic by Joe Bodding, who talks a lot about the film itself and the themes attached to it. And then we also have Tallulah Bankhead and Silvio, uh, Narizano, who, who is the director here. He's a Canadian. Silvio is the Canadian director of this film. I don't think I mentioned that, um, who uh, was only really uh, around to direct some TV specials and a few movies. Uh, hadn't really directed much before that, which I thought was really interesting. And then the other thing is there's an interview with the director and then talks a lot about uh, Richard Matheson on Fanatic, who was the one who actually adapted this. You know, the, the person who adapted I Am Legend, this is uh, Richard Matheson right here, uh, the writer. Uh, and then also Stephanie Powers on Looped. You know, I was telling you about that production that, and, and how on um, Tallulah Bankhead herself. And then there's a contemporary, contemporary review of Fanatic in here. So this one in particular, I think this is actually the one that has the best special features out of all of them. It has a lot of really great things attached to it. And I didn't even talk about the film itself. But like I said, the score kind of makes this film a little bit up and down. But at the same time, the performances by Tallulah Bankhead and also Stephanie Powers in particular are the ones that really are compelling in this film because Phil the Bankhead is just this religious zealot who is cannot get over her son's death and she blames Stephanie Powers who is the former fiance. All right, there's gonna be a little bit of a cut here and I apologize, there, my battery passed away, died and I had to recharge it. But anyway, I was talking about Fanatic and I don't know where actually where I was left off with this but I just wanted to say this film was really great and the performances by Tallulah Bankhead and also uh, Stephanie Powers who was our, our main actress in this film um, and our main lead, she did fantastic work and she was actually going to pay Tallulah Bankhead's character a visit who is the mother of her former fiance and realizing that Tallulah Bankhead is actually a, 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 kind of a fanatic and a religious zealot uh, at that and kind of blames Stephanie Powers' character for the death of her son. So that's kind of the premise of this film, but also you have a young Donald Sutherland in this film, which I thought was really cool. It's like, and I'm like, I recognize that son of a gun and it's Donald Sutherland, which is really crazy. But um, yeah, I really, really love this film and it really just showcases, I, I think the overall, what showcases with all of these films is the power, uh, I would say uh, these films in particular of the female cast of Hammer. And to me, I, honestly, kind of giving it a, uh, you know, a look at all four of the films in general, I think the lead females in each of these these 
films were probably the best part of them. And that might be my main takeaway from this particular set. Um, but yeah, anyway, how many of you have seen, uh, we have Maniac, The Gorgon, Curse of, The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb, and Fanatic right here. Um, these are all, like I said, available for individual per uh, purchase on Indicator's site, but also you can get them in the Mill Creek Ultimate Collection uh, from Hammer S. Yes. Tell me down in the comment section down below what you thought of each of these films, if any of you have seen them, uh, and if any of you are planning on watching them. I'm really excited for my Hammer journey, and in 2021, I plan on diving very deep into Hammer and uh, diving a little bit more into depth with the films themselves, the extra features that uh, accompany it, and also just learning about the history of the time period of these films and the production and, and all these extra little things that, you know, like Barbara Shelley wanting to use snakes in the Gorgon, which I, thought, I just thought I think is really, really cool. And Tallulah Bankhead not knowing much about her and her past and yeah, it's just, it's phenomenal, and a lot of this exploration of knowledge is just really fascinating. It's a lot of fun, and yeah, I'm discovering it myself for the first time. So anyway, I've ranted far far too long. Uh, what'd you think of this set? Uh, if anybody of you have it, um, congratulations. Like I said, it's out of print, but like I said, you can get these films individually, so definitely go do that. Uh, give this video a like, comment down below, share your thoughts on, on each of these films and on Hammer, and share this video, hit the notification bell, and I'll see you next time. I'm not jonesing around.